Hi, everybody. Uh, when I grow up, I want to be Pedro, really. I mean, the stuff that this guy does, unbelievable. Uh, what I'm going to talk, however, is about stuff that is much more simple, and I'll tell you why. When you talk to CEOs and security professionals and you try to explain the risk, they will always think that if it's very complicated, then most of the chances are it can't be done. And in fact, I can tell you from a previous visit that I made in Japan, this thinking is very common here. You like to look at one example and not always see the similarities to you. Well, what I'm going to show you today are examples that are so simple that after I finish my presentation, every single one of you can do the same. And these examples, when you show them to professionals, all of a sudden they're like, oh, this can happen to me. Um, as you can see here, I am the former malware and security uh, research manager. I just left uh, Checkpoint two weeks ago. I'm presenting this with their permission. As you can see, it still has their uh, logo on it. Um, it's very nice of them. They even offered to pay me for coming here. Um, so, what I'm showing you is part of what our vulner or their vulnerability team, uh, vulnerability research team was doing. The purpose is to disclose vulnerabilities. You've heard today, uh, Karen mentioned that earlier, when you find a vulnerability and you disclose it, it forces companies to fix it because no one wants to sell you a bad product when you know it's a bad product. So the way to do that is through a responsible disclosure. First, you go to the vendor. You tell them, look, you have a problem. And it's your problem, and you have to fix it. We do not offer the solution. If we offer the solution, that would make people suspect us, because it would give us an incentive to find problems, because we would say, OK, you have a problem. If you pay me, I will fix it. No. We tell people, you have a problem. We will show you the problem, but you have to fix it. And we will give them a certain amount of time based on the complexity of fixing it. And when that time passes, or if we're nice a little bit more, we will go for a full disclosure. And a full disclosure is when you tell the whole world what's wrong. Sometimes you will give a proof of concept, but the problem of a proof of concept is that it's a loaded weapon. And if you give it to people, some people might use it in the wrong way. So sometimes you just show a video that proves that you know what you're talking about. Okay, so you've seen Pedro do his magic, but you don't have that code, right? So you know he can do it, but you don't know how to do that. So it's more or less the same thing. I'll give four examples. The first one, uh, who's gone to the cinema recently? Guys, you need to get a lie. Come on. <laughs> Today when you go to the cinema, you buy the ticket at home over the internet, and then you go to the cinema, and there's this device that lets you print the ticket that you already bought. You can also buy the ticket there, but if you wait with that, you won't get the seats you want. So this device has a touch screen, a credit card reader, a ticket printer, and that's it. No peripherals, there's nothing to connect, no wireless, no ports. So theoretically, it's hardened. There's nothing you can do. Or is there? Let's see. Let's ignore the Hebrew here. Imagine that it's me looking at Japanese, same effect. And these are menu settings that should not have been there. This is a touch screen. And this top menu bar should not have left, should not have been left there. Someone made a mistake. And of all the menus, the menu options, they all don't work, except one. Maybe because they thought that that one option is not dangerous. And that option is actually print settings. Doesn't look dangerous, right? I mean, what can you do? Do something bad to the printer? Well, guess what? When you go to the print settings, you get this little dialog box. And that box offers you to add printers. OK, there's a little button on the bottom left that says network. And that, too, shouldn't have been there, OK? It's very easy to take it off, but they didn't. And when you press that button, what you get is a Windows Explorer letting you search the network for additional printers. Now, this window is limited. You can only look for printers. 
If I'm an attacker, it's not good enough. I can still use this to make a complete list of all the directories, which is also good because then I know install software, maybe revisions, but we want more. And there comes another problem. The touch screen is fully compatible with human interface device, which means that when you press your finger for two seconds, you get a right click. And you know what happens when you right click a directory name? You get the option to open it in a new window. And when you do that, you get a new non-restricted Windows Explorer. And now you can do whatever you want, go around the system and look for interesting things, which is what I did. So the first thing that I find is a directory name called credit. Okay, so that, that is interesting. That is also something Karen mentioned earlier today. Uh, hackers like to steal credit cards. Now remember, I am the good guy. I'm playing a white hat, or if it's the red theme, it's a red hat. If I had known Karen was mentioning it, I would have brought the hat, I forgot. And um, I want to make it to the credit card and, and steal those. This is the role I'm playing. And if you look inside that directory, there is a list of many, many files, and they're all called TRAN, and then B in a number. Anybody wants to guess what TRAN stands for? Transaction. Transaction, thank you, Kelly. And indeed, if you drag and drop one of those onto a very sophisticated hacking tool called Notepad, <laughs> then what you get is unencrypted credit card numbers in a text file. Now here's the problem. Okay, by the way, 4580, that's an Israeli Visa card. 5326, Israeli MasterCard. So this is the real deal. This stuff came off the magnetic stripe. If I steal that and I put it on a magnetic stripe, then I can use it pretty much anywhere. Now, what can I do with that? I'm a hacker. I want to steal that, right? So obviously I can take a photo. This was taken with my little point and shoot camera. But the problem with taking a photo, well actually there are a number of problems. First of all, it's a limited um, bandwidth. What you see now is what I get in every photo I take. And these are long files and there are many of them. Second problem is I need to type that. So yes, OCR, there are solutions. And the third problem, when you stand in front of this device and you take photos, people start asking questions. How do I know? Because the cinema manager came to me and said, excuse me, can I help you? So I looked at him and I said, no, it's okay. There's a security problem here and I'm working on it, which I was. <laughs> now, I did not lie. There was a security problem and I was working on it, okay? So this is social engineering. I gave him two little pieces of the puzzle and he completed the picture. Now, as far as he is concerned, I am working for that company. If I told him that the device is malfunctioning and needs to be replaced, he would have helped me carry it to my car. Just saying. But what do I have at my disposal? A printer. Okay. This is, this is fun. I'm, I'm telling a joke and then I'm waiting for the translations and then you laugh. It's cool. I love that. So we can use the ticket to take it home. Now, a little anecdote. When I first did that, I forgot that by default, Notepad does not do line wrapping. So I got two meters of paper with credit card numbers. But by then, my cover story was established. I was working for the company, so that was okay. Now, at this stage, there is enough for a disclosure. Unencrypted credit card data can be stolen by criminal. Now, it's important to say that at least in Israel, they are not breaking the law. It's not illegal. Maybe, pardon my French, they're assholes. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I just did. But they're not breaking the law. Maybe they're breaking PCI, so you might stop doing business with them, but they are not criminals. So we said if they do this, there might be more. And there was. Who can see what that little text document says? 
It says begin RSA private key, begin certificate. Also, non encrypted text files. And hey, I have a printer. So I printed it, and I took it home, and I OCR'd it. And then because, remember, this is a movie ticket. There's this little part that they tear. So that ruined two letters in every line. I had to manually fix that. But when I did that, I had the complete key and certificate for billing. So now, not only can I steal your credit card number, I can also bill you for it. And you will have to explain to your husband or wife why you saw a film for $25,000 <laughs> and what exactly kind of film that was. So summing up the first example, the purpose of the device, give you movie tickets, maybe choose the seats. What we got from it was credit card numbers and encryption keys. Now, what sophisticated hacking tool did we use for this? A finger. How many of you have a finger? You should all be raising your hand. Thank you. Now, it appears that once I started giving this talk, I started a trend. This is my Facebook. A friend of mine was doing the same thing somewhere else. And he's proud of it, so he puts it on Facebook, right? And he tags me. Now this guy, Yoav, really likes to play poker. So a week later, I reciprocate. I say, Yoav, I call on your Yes Planet, and I raise. This is the Israeli post office. This device prints the number in the line. When you stand in the line, it prints a number. This device was connected to the entire network of the Israeli post office. So a day later, another friend says, I can do that too. So yes, now you can do that. Second example, point of sale devices are all around you. And especially after the target breach, people started paying attention to those. This is a photo that I took in the United States. In some places in the world, uh, the United States and Australia, they call waiters servers, okay? I don't know why, it's politically correct. But even if you are called a server, you do not need the IP address of the point of sale device. And for an attacker, this is valuable information. Okay, so in Israel, we have good weather. Same as here, only warmer. Right now in Tel Aviv, 22 degrees. And restaurants have place on the sidewalk where they can put chairs and tables so people can sit outside. And of course, to make the service better, they also put a point of sale device outside. So the waiters or servers don't need to go back all the way inside. Now at the end of the day, they, took, they take everything and put it back inside. Why? Because it's Israel, it's not Japan. If you leave it on the street, you look away for 10 minutes, it's gone. But what do they not lock? What is left outside on the street? This. This is left outside on the street. Now, do you know why? It's because these people are not in the business of IT security. They are in the business of serving you coffee. This is their profession. Hopefully, this is their training, not always. They have no idea what the significance of leaving this in the street is. So all you have to do is show up with your computer and a network cable and just Within a second, you're on the internal network. So I'm an attacker, right? So I start by gathering intelligence. I want to collect as much information as I can so I can do the most damage or achieve as many goals as I want. And we start by listening to traffic. This is a screenshot from Wireshark, basic tool. 
And you can already see that there is a lot of traffic on the network. A lot of servers are talking to each other. So you get IP addresses, you get protocols, right? This is just by listening. I haven't said anything yet. So if you do some mapping, we detected five active computers on the network. And now we start looking around. Now, because I know how these devices work, and I also have some previous experience, I know that they're using SMB, which is the file sharing, okay? And I'm politely asking by protocol, this is not a tool, this is OSX, okay? In Windows, you would uh, do backslash, backslash and then the IP address. And I'm kindly asking the server, are you willing to give me access to your files? And of course, as the protocol dictates, I get this question, are you a registered user or a guest? Now, even though I'm playing the hacker, I wanna be honest. I don't wanna lie, so I'm saying I'm a guest. <laughs> what I expect to receive is no access. What I do receive is full access to both volumes on the point of sale device. Now, what can you do with full read and write access to somebody else's hard drive? A lot. You start by looking around because you want to establish attack vectors. Remember, now is my intelligence gathering act. When I want to attack, I will come again and I want to be prepared. So I want to gather as much information as I have so I have time to prepare all the tools because I might only have one opportunity to come back. So I'm starting to look at files, and look at that. MDB files, database files. And they're very big, 93 megabytes. Now these could be anything. They could be transaction history. They could be customer records. They could be supplier records. This means that if I'm your competition, I can take you out of business because I know all your business secrets, right? And if you keep looking, there's a file called admin MDB. That's even more interesting. And look at that, TRAN B001. Sounds familiar? It is. Once again, unencrypted credit card numbers in a text file. Why? Because it's the same engine. And an interesting fact, here you can see not only the 5326 MasterCard and the 4580 Visa, you can also see additional numbers like 1120 and 1510. These are uh, prepaid credit cards only for the restaurant industry. In Israel, when you work at a company, this is how they pay for your meal. You get a credit card, you can only use it in restaurants, and they load it up with money and you use it. So I can eat at a restaurant at somebody else's expense. The next thing we do, we create a file list. Now, why do I do that? I'm connected to the network. I can copy the entire thing. But remember, I am the good guy. If I copy files from their system onto mine, I am now creating a new risk that did not exist before. And I will be responsible for that data. So I don't want to do that. So instead, I will just make a directory listing. And that is also very useful because I can determine what software is installed and what version is installed, and then later match it with exploits or tools. So when I do get the other opportunity, I will come ready. And then I get to this IP address. That one does not have SMB. So I know it's not a point of sale device. So my first guess is that that would be the ADSL router because these small businesses work with ADSL. So all ADSL routers have a web UI, and I try to access the web UI, but what I get is this. Now, if you look at it, you can see that this actually is HTML, but for some reason, I received it as a text file. Now, if you have ever looked at the web UI of your ADSL modem, you know what it looks like. On the top, there is a bar with the brand name and the version. On the left, there is a menu, and on the right, the mainframe 
this is where all the menu options are. So if you look at the script, you see it's exactly like that. So I said, okay, let's just take that URL and try directly. And what I got is this printer name. This is the printer. When you ask for the bill or a receipt, this is the printer. So for, for me as an attacker, there's not a lot I can do with that. Maybe I can leave them a message. Your business was pawned by a super evil hacker, right? However, this screen contains another piece of the puzzle. This one tells me the IP address of the gateway. As an attacker, I'm building a picture of my targets. And every little piece of information counts. And this is an important one because now I know where the router is. But actually, it turns out that I already had that information. If we look back on the Wireshark capture, you will see that on the line, you press, can you press there? Yes, thank you. That is an ARP broadcast of the router. How do I know? Because the device is a D-Link. They make communication devices, network devices. Okay? So, like all routers, it has a web UI, but it has access control. Who would like to guess the credentials for this? Someone who hasn't participated yet. Maybe you, sir. Admin, admin. <laughs> and yes. Now, <laughs> why is this dangerous? For two different reasons. The first one, I can go to the menu and enable the remote administration, which means I can now go home. Remember, I'm still in the middle of the street connected to a wall, right? I can go home and connect to the network from home. But this is a menu item. And maybe one day the administrator will look at that menu and say, whoa, I didn't set that. Who set it? And then they will unset it, and then I have a problem. But there is something a lot more dangerous that I can do. I'm going to ask you an honest question and notice that unlike before, I will not be raising my hand. Who knows by heart the IP address for their DNS servers? You had to, you, you said it. So very few people know by heart the IP address for their DNS. Now why is that important? Inside your network, since this device is also a DHCP server, this device will be your DNS. And if, you, if I change the DNS IP here, inside the network, you wouldn't see that. But what I will have created is DNS hijacking, which is pretty much what the DNS changer Trojan was doing. And the chances of someone detecting that are very, very low. And that will enable me to pretty much play a man in the middle attack on all your traffic. So, the purpose of the device, it was a cash register and it was a local server to collect all the logs. What we got, once again, credit card numbers and customer database. Now, what sophisticated hacking tools did I use? An off-the-shelf MacBook Pro and a free software that everybody can download. That's it, very simple. Now, it turns out that this problem of unintended wall ports is a lot more common than you would think. This is a medical clinic where I go to. As you can see, the attendance clock is connected to the local network. Now it turns out that in many, many businesses, attendance systems are on the corporate network, not even on a separate LAN or a VLAN, which means that all I have to do is unplug that device and connect something else, and I'm inside the network, okay? Now, in this particular case, I don't even have to disconnect their device because there is an extra port right here, all right? 
So, who is familiar with this device? This is a TP-Link TLWR703N. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a router. It has an Ethernet port. It has a USB port to which you can connect a 3G modem, GSM modem, and connect to it from anywhere in the world. And inside, it has wireless uh, network. So this means that I can connect this to the local area network configure it to be an access point, and then raise your local area network to wireless, and then just go out across the street and connect to your network. Now the problem with this one is that it requires USB power. Not a problem. There's a electric socket just there, right? But this little guy actually has a big brother. Look at this. This is the same device, but with a five hour battery. And it's white. This is a medical facility. It fits, right? It's white. All I have to do is brand it, put a little sticker. Medical clinic, do not disconnect. Who's gonna touch that? No one, right? And it fits in your pocket. This is a hospital in Tel Aviv. Hospitals have two different wireless networks. One is for visitors and patients. The other one, strongly encrypted, is used for the medical staff. It has all the patient records, all your medical information. But what use is strong wireless encryption if all I have to do is disconnect the access point from the LAN port and connect my own? Using this little white device, I get direct access to your now not encrypted uh, network, right? This is an ATM at a shopping mall. And just to make sure everyone understands it's an ATM, it says so. <laughs> now I'm sure you all know by now, ATMs are nothing more than PCs running Windows XP or sometimes not even that. So maybe the traffic is encrypted, maybe it's not. Maybe if I put a man in the middle and plug it off and plug it back on, it's gonna look for PXE, but you don't know. But there's a lot to be done. And it turns out that no one is immune. I have a habit, a bad habit, some say, of giving local examples from places I speak at. This is the server room, which is roughly there. No, you don't have that there, so look here. This is brand new, this is the secret ingredient. <laughs> now, what, what access control is there on that open cabinet? Physical access control. <laughs> with a very scary sign. Now wait. I, I am authorized. I am authorized. I am authorized. It's okay. I have permission. Now, what is the problem with this, you ask? Well, some dangerous people. <laughs> another speaker with permission. We were all authorized. This is okay. He can have access to that room. And you know what he likes to do? Okay, but just to make everybody relaxed, no harm was done, okay? We didn't actually change anything. Okay, so, last year my dad was not feeling well. He went to the hospital, and in the hospital they have this device. This is a TV screen, and you can uh, watch television, listen to music, uh, watch video on demand, basically stuff that they can charge you for, right? Um, so it has a touch screen, a credit card reader that will always attract my attention, and earphones 
But what else does this device have? A USB port. Not just one. Three. Three USB ports begging for some attention. And since I'm a nice guy, I start with a USB keyboard. <laughs> that is an integral tool in my kit. Okay? And I connect the USB keyboard and I see that the numlock is working, which means the computer recognizes it as a keyboard, but nothing else works. So there is security, right? They know that if you connect a keyboard, they don't want to let you do anything with it. So what do you do? What do they always tell you to do if you have a problem with your computer? Power off, power on. This, this here is the power cord. You just pull it out, put it back in, and then you hit F111. And then, boom. <laughs> Now, why was there no password? I don't know. But once you have access to the BIOS, you can do whatever you want. For example, you can boot from a different device. Now, I don't know if you can see, there's a little USB drive here. Over, where's the cursor? Over there, there's a USB drive. What would be the operating system of choice for booting somebody else's device. This, of course. Now, <laughs> this is from last year, so by now it's Kali, but you know. Backtrack, never leave home without it. It's actually right here in my bag. And that, of course, works. Now, I am the administrator on their system. And it turns out that their system is also Linux. So, of course, I mount their hard drives and I have full read and write access. Now what I'm interested in is network. And there's a problem. Even though I can see that their computer is configured to run through DHCP, I am not getting an IP address. And that is not good. Because there is only a limited amount of information you can get from one computer. Okay? I can maybe steal the credit card numbers of all the people that were in that bed. That's not enough. I want to think big. Think uh, scalability, OK? And the good thing is that this is Linux. So in Linux, everything is in the config files, and it's all text. And when you look at the text file, you see that, to my surprise, they're actually using 802.1x. They are using encryption on the wired network. And that was very impressive. They had my respect for 20 seconds. Now, why was it for only 20 seconds? Because, like I said, this is Linux and everything is in text files. So, two text files to the left, you have the credentials. So, all you have to do is copy two files onto your system and then IF down, IF up, and you now have an IP address on the encrypted network. Now remember, this is inside a hospital. So the first thing we want to do at this stage, this is enough for a disclosure. So what we do is a proof of concept that we send together with the disclosure. So this is my colleague, me opening a Netcat connection, simulating a reverse shell or a bot contacting the CNC server. And this is actually a response to a command that my colleague is entering back at the office. So now we're ready. We move on. Looking at the configuration files, we see this um, URI. So we are detectives. We are looking for clues. We want to understand the bigger picture, get as much information as we can. And this URL actually is the original user interface. If you remember, this was the first slide. But unlike the first slide, this one is in my browser in my operating system. Still works, by the way. 
So, being the criminal that I am, if this says client, what else would you try? Admin. And it works. So this is the web server. And later, we actually found the credentials to that server. Now, there are 3,500 beds in that hospital. And they are all browsing into the same web server. So if I put a little gift, this is Hanukkah now, so it's a good time. I put a Hanukkah gift on that server. I have created a 3,500 computer botnet. Because the next time they turn the computer on, they will surf to my server and execute my payload. So what happens next? My dad got better, which was a good thing. And uh, we lost access to the device. So the natural thing to do is complete the disclosure and send it to the company. However, we discovered that other hospitals, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're already reading the punchline, I get it. So it turns out that other hospitals have the same device, so now we're just waiting for someone to get sick so we can go visit them and continue the research. Yes, we are sick bastards, I know. So, summing up, the purpose of the device was a TV or a smart TV for hospital patients. What we got, we got network encryption, we got possible botnet, and we got a possible access to other networks. We didn't have enough time to look, but this is in a hospital, remember. Maybe there is access to other networks. What sophisticated hacking tools did we use for this? I'm pretty sure about 30% of you have these right now, maybe except for the keyboard. And you don't need a license to buy those, okay? Last example. Last year, I was flying to present this at uh, the Kaspersky SAS event in the Dominican Republic. This is Terminal 5 at the uh, JFK. And I arrived 40 minutes early to my flight. And I got bored. And you don't want me to get bored. It's not good. And I saw these devices. And these devices are used for selling stuff. While you wait for your plane, you can buy things from stores at the terminal, and then they will bring it to you before you go on the plane, right? So it has a touch screen, and it has a credit card reader. So guess what? It got my attention. And I tried escaping the interface, which didn't work. I was trying a bunch of things, didn't work. And then I remembered something. I ducked under the device. <laughs> and guess what? I have four USB ports and the network cable. So by then, I pulled out my famous USB keyboard. And guess what? I'm the administrator on the Windows XP. You can see here it says administrator. So I was scanning the network and I discovered 74 additional devices. Right? There are 75 computers configured the same. And I have internet connection. I have access to the outside world, which means that I can use a simple trick like Pedro showed you and just fetch an attack tool from the outside world and install it locally. Okay? And I also, and this is very important as an attacker, when you trace route, you discover the various levels of routing you have. And then you learn of the devices between you and the internet. Because just like the previous example was inside a hospital, this example is inside an airport. Okay? So maybe there is access to other networks. I don't know. 
when you start looking at the files, you discover that they are using Ultra VNC. Ultra VNC is a remote desktop uh, application, which means that the people that maintain the system connect to it from the outside world. If they can do it, I can do it. And if you look inside, you will see that there is a file called rc4.key. So once again, they had my respect for 20 seconds. Why 20 seconds? Because I can read that file. Now, I was expecting a text password. And I typed the file, and this is not text. This is binary. Now, who can remember? You have to be old enough. Who can remember how to do a hex dump on a Windows XP with no external tool? Debug. OK, before we had the splendid IDA Pro or IDA, we had debug and turbo debugger. And debug lets you dump the file. And you can see that this is a 128-bit encryption key, which I now have. And it turns out that even the router that they were using was giving a lot of information that was very useful for an attacker with no authentication. Yes, when you want to change the settings, you need to enter a name and a password. And it was not the default. But there was a lot of information here that as an attacker, I can very much use. So, the purpose of the device, airport entertainment and shopping, what we got, network encryption keys or VNC encryption keys, and possible access to other networks. What sophisticated hacking tool did I use for this? This. And I'll be honest, this is a lie. I did not use the USB drive. But when I was documenting what I was doing, I was taking pictures with my camera. And the quality, quality was really bad because of the light and the reflection. And I said, I, I can't show you guys this. this looks like shit. So I said, let's do screen capture. It's my system, right? Now, I only use the USB drive to save the screen captures so I can put them in a the presentation. And there was even a little problem. This system did not have MS Paint. <laughs> now, remember, I'm the good guy. So even though I'm the administrator and I could have downloaded MS Paint and install it, I didn't want to make any change to the system. So that was another challenge. How can you save screenshots from the clipboard to a file if you don't have MS Paint? And the answer, WordPad. WordPad lets you paste the photo, and then you can save the document. So I had a bunch of RTF files, which I later extracted the photos from. All right, so summing up my presentation. Local networks are rarely as monitored and as protected as the internet gateway. Everybody knows that you have to monitor the traffic between your organization and the internet. It's obvious. But how many organizations monitor the traffic inside? Would you know if someone from finance tried to access the server with the source code? Who would know that? Would that be registered somewhere? And would anyone look at it and know? And many devices that are publicly accessible are not protected. And I'm not talking about this cabinet here. I'm talking about devices in hospitals, universities, airports, conference centers, public uh, transportation stations. Many devices are not hardened because it's very easy to disable USB ports by software or just jam them, but people don't do that. And compromising a device on an internal network can easily be leveraged in a network proliferation operation because I am past your detection. I'm already inside. You will not detect me. 
Okay. So basically, the best practice is ask yourself, would you trust me to walk around in your business? And if the answer is no, then first of all, don't call me. And second, <laughs> do your hardening. Do your homework. Hardening is an old trait. Tons of documents are available. And David here, which we'll speak later today, has done amazing things with government facilities using the exact same, I wouldn't even call it a trick. It's that simple. So it's not all about cyber. Yes, cyber is important. The internet is important. But pretty much like Karen said earlier today, cyber is a lot more than that. It's pretty much all the things. And when you look for a protective measure and they tell you all about their cyber protection, don't forget to look at the physical access. Thank you.